In medieval Europe, animals that misbehaved could be criminally tried in court. For example, in 1457, a sow in Savigny, France, with six piglets in tow, attacked and killed a five-year-old. Nowadays, the sow's owner might face criminal charges for negligence, but medieval Europeans had different notions of law and justice. The authorities in Savigny charged the sow with murder, and brought charges against the piglets as accomplices. A lawyer was appointed to defend the accused, and after testimony was heard, a judge found the porcine guilty. In accordance with local custom, he sentenced her to be hanged to death by her hind legs. If it was any relief to the sow, her execution was not as painful as that of another pig convicted of homicide in Falaise. Normandy, in 1386. It was sentenced not only to hang, but to also be maimed in the head and forelegs before hanging. The piglets did not share their mother's fate. Although they had been found covered in blood, their participation in the murder was not proven, so they were acquitted. To criminally try an animal might strike us today as ludicrous, because we know that animals lack the moral agency necessary to make them culpable for crimes. People thought differently in medieval Europe, however. All involved, judges, lawyers, bailiffs, and hangmen in case the animal was found guilty, took the proceedings quite seriously. The Savigny sow had been imprisoned pending the trial, and the jailer charged the same daily rate for the pig's board as that of human prisoners. The court hired a professional hangman to carry out the sentence, and he charged the same fees as those charged for the execution of a human. Conventional wisdom has it that most medieval people seldom traveled far from where they were born. That is true, especially in the case of peasants and those who lived in the countryside. However, that was not unique to the Middle Ages. The same could be said for the majority of people throughout most of history, both before and after the medieval era, until relatively recently in the modern era. That should not be taken to mean that people back then never traveled, many of them did. Pilgrimages to holy sites were quite popular in the Middle Ages. Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, for example, revolves around pilgrims traveling from London to St. Becket's Shrine at Canterbury Cathedral. That was a relatively short holy quest. Other pilgrimages took the pious to holy sites hundreds or even thousands of miles away from home. Traders also traveled far and wide to buy, sell, and transport high-value goods. The medieval long-distance trade economy featured among other things amber and furs from the Baltic, spices from India transported through the Middle East, and silks from China. Elections were not as widespread and regular in the medieval world as they are today. Nor was there anything at the time like universal suffrage. However, medieval people did have elections. They routinely elected aldermen, members of parliament, bishops, abbots, popes, and sometimes even kings. There were, of course, important differences between medieval elections and modern ones. Not least among the differences was just how narrow was the slice of the population that got to vote in any elections. However, there were also striking similarities, chief among them the belief that elections conferred legitimacy. People in the Middle Ages had ambivalent views when it came to elections. On the one hand, the medieval belief in elections was based on precedents from the Bible. For example, the Old Testament contains accounts of the Israelites electing judges and kings. Also, kings sometimes died without issue, the papacy was not hereditary, and town burghers needed to select people to fill local government positions. Elections were handy in such situations. On the other hand, elections were also seen as cause for strife, and potential starting points for riots, rebellions, or civil wars. The oppression and exploitation of peasants by the aristocracy was a hallmark of the Middle Ages. However, medieval peasants didn't always simply put it up with. From time to time, when they'd finally had enough, peasants rose up in bloody rebellions that terrified and shook society to its foundations. One such was the Cade Rebellion, in 1450. 
Jack Cade, an Irishman of unknown occupation and little-known background who resided in Kent, organized a rebellion among peasants and small proprietors. Cade had been living in Sussex until 1449, when he fled to France to escape a murder charge. He returned to England under an assumed name in 1450, and settled in Kent. At the time, many were angered by oppressively high taxes and a recent steep rise in prices. That, coupled with widespread corruption and abuse of power by the royal advisers and officials of the weak and hapless King Henry VI, transformed England into a powder keg. Small outbreaks of violence grew into a rebellion that gathered steam. It soon became a major popular revolt and peasant uprising that rocked England and terrorized its government and aristocracy. In June, 1450, Cade emerged as the leader of what had become a major rebellion against the royal government. He called himself John Mortimer, and identified with the king's rivals, the York branch of the royal family. Jack Cade issued a manifesto, in which he demanded the removal of several royal ministers and the recall of Richard, Duke of York, from Ireland, where he was a virtual exile. A royal army sent to the suppress the rebels was defeated in Kent. That supercharged the rebellion, and the insurrectionists' rapidly increasing host marched on London. They captured the city on July 3, 1450, along with the hated royal treasurer, James Fines, Lord Say and Seal, whom the rebels executed. Despite Cade's attempt to maintain discipline, once they entered London, many rebels began to loot the city. The lawlessness led Londoners to turn on the rebels. They expelled Cade's men from the city on July 6. After a battle at London Bridge. To end the revolt, the government issued royal pardons and persuaded most rebels to disperse. Cade fled, but was tracked down a week later, wounded in a skirmish with royal forces, and captured. He was taken to London, but died of his wounds en route. His death marked the end of the rebellion. While the revolt failed, it contributed to a breakdown of royal authority and prestige that set the stage for the Wars of the Roses, that broke out a few years later. When many picture the Middle Ages, a common assumption is that the era was one of widespread superstition, in which church authorities burned witches left, right, and center. It is true that medieval people were extremely superstitious, especially when compared to the modern era. However, their superstitions did not find expression in witch hunts. While there were some witch trials in the Middle Ages, they were relatively rare, and were usually done by the secular authorities, not directed by the church. Indeed, throughout most of the medieval era, the standard message disseminated by churchmen when it came to magic was that it was silly nonsense that did not work. The European witch craze was more of a 16th and 17th century phenomenon. It took off after Heinrich Kramer wrote the infamous Malleus Maleficarum in the late 15th century, in an attempt to convince a then-skeptical public that witches were real. When the book first came out, the church actually condemned it, and warned inquisitors not to believe what it says. As seen in an earlier entry, Jack Cade's rebellion was vicious and violent. However, bad as things got, Cade's rebels never went so far as to actually eat their oppressors. Not so the rebels of the Jackery, a medieval peasant revolt in northern France in 1358. It got its name from the nobility's habit of contemptuously referring to all peasants as Jacques or Jacques Bonhomme, after a padded overgarment worn by them called a Jacques. The revolt was led by a well-off peasant named Guillaume Cale, from Beauvais, about 50 miles from Paris. France had gone through a rough patch after the outbreak of the Hundred Years' War. The peasantry, upon whose toil all rested and through whose fields the armies marched and pillaged, endured the roughest patch of all. Their overlords, the French nobility, were not doing well either, and their prestige had sunk to a low ebb after decades of humiliating defeats. Early in the century, France's aristocrats had turned tail and fled at the Battle of the Spurs. They left the infantry commoners to be slaughtered. More recently, 
they had suffered catastrophic defeats at the hands of the English in the battles of Crecy and Poitiers. The French defeat at Poitiers was particularly humiliating because the nobility allowed the king's capture. Its aftermath was particularly onerous upon the peasantry, because the English demanded a huge ransom for the king's release. Naturally, it was squeezed from the peasants. Finally, the French nobility failed in their basic raison d'etre that justified their high status, protection of the populace from enemy depredations. Unchecked by the peasants' aristocratic overlords and supposed protectors, English and Gascon mercenaries roamed the countryside to pillage and assault at will. Matters came to a head on May 21, 1358, when peasants from a village near the Oise River killed a knight. Then roasted him on a spit and forced his children to eat his flesh. The revolt spread quickly, as peasants razed local castles and slaughtered their inhabitants. Eventually, disparate rebel bands combined under the leadership of Guillaume Cale, who then joined forces with Parisian rebels under Etienne Marcel. The revolt burned hot, but it also burned out quick. The undisciplined and untrained rebels were soon routed once the militarily trained and better armed nobles organized and fell upon them. The Paris uprising collapsed after its leader was assassinated. Guillaume Cale, with his peasant army, assembled for battle, unwisely accepted an invitation for truce talks with the armed nobles' leader. Charles the Bad of Navarre Cale was treacherously seized when he showed up, tortured, and beheaded. The now leaderless peasant army was then ridden down by knights and routed. Afterwards, the peasants were subjected to massive collective reprisals and a reign of terror in which around 20,000 were killed. Medieval concepts of justice, especially the belief in rational adjudication to reach a just decision, differed greatly from those of the modern world. A common alternative to the resolution of a dispute before a neutral arbiter learned in the law in order to decide the facts of a case and the rights and wrongs of it, was trial by ordeal. The idea was to subject an accused or both parties to a dispute to a dangerous and painful experience, whose outcome was unknown going in. They would then let God decide who was innocent or guilty or in the right. Variations included ordeal by water, in which an accused was tied and thrown into a body of water, and were deemed innocent if they floated. And guilty if not. There was also the ordeal by fire, in which an accused held a red-hot bar of iron and walked three paces. If their hand healed after three days, they were innocent, if not, they were guilty. For the aristocrats, there was ordeal by combat, in which accusers fought the accused, and victory presumably went to the one in the right. Medieval authorities were brutal when they finally put a lid on peasant uprisings. One of the most vivid examples of such brutality took place in the aftermath of the suppression of the Hungarian Peasant Rebellion, led by George Doja, 1470-1514. A Transylvanian nobleman and soldier of fortune. After he made a name for himself in wars against the Ottoman Turks, Doja was appointed by Pope Leo X to lead a crusade. Things went awry, however and the result was not a crusade, but a revolt by downtrodden Hungarian peasants against their rapacious overlords. The uprising was fierce, but ultimately unsuccessful. After the peasants were put down, Dojo went down in history as both a notorious criminal and as a Christian martyr. After the Pope directed Dojo to lead a crusade, about 40,000 volunteers gathered beneath his banner. They were comprised in the main of peasants, friars, and parish priests, medieval society's lowest rungs. The Hungarian nobility however neither supplied the crusaders nor offered military leadership. The later was seen as particularly unseemly, because military leadership was the main justification for the aristocracy's elevated status. Before long, the gathered throng began to voice its collective grievances against the nobles. At harvest time, the peasants refused to return and reap their lord's fields. The nobles tried to seize the peasants by force and compel them to toil. That did not sit well with Doja, who sided with the serfs against his own class. <laughs>
So he led Hungary's peasants in a violent rebellion that morphed into a war of extermination against the landlords. Hungarian peasant put hundreds of castles and aristocratic manors to the torch. They also killed thousands of the gentry, many of whom were tortured to death or executed in a variety of gruesome ways, such as crucifixion or impalement. The rebellion was finally crushed, and the peasantry was crushed with it. Hungary's peasants were subjected to a reign of terror and a wave of retaliatory vengeance by the nobles. Over 70,000 were tortured to death, and the peasants as a class were condemned to perpetual servitude. They were permanently bound to the soil, fined heavily, had their taxes sharply hiked, and the number of days they had to work for their landlords was increased. As to their leader, Dojo was captured and condemned to a fiendishly cruel death. Accused among other things of having sought to become king, Dojo was sentenced to sit on a hot iron throne, while a heated iron crown was affixed to his head. Next, bloody hunks were torn out of his body. Nine of his chief lieutenants, starved beforehand, were forced to eat his flesh. The aristocratic backlash backfired, however. Twelve years later the Ottoman Turks invaded Hungary, and found it relatively easy to conquer what was still a bitterly divided country. Doja's legacy lived on. The revolutionary aspects of his life were drawn upon heavily during the communist era in Romania, his land of birth. Likewise in Hungary. Where Doja is the most popular street name in villages, and a main avenue and metro station in Budapest bear his name. Life was no bed of roses for medieval peasants. They lived in cramped quarters, lacked many amenities we take for granted, performed backbreaking work, sanitation was abysmal, and they were exploited by the nobility. They often had to worry about famine, plague, and war. However, we might envy them one thing, they worked fewer hours than us and had way more vacation time. The modern perception of medieval peasants is often one that views them as exploited, downtrodden, brutalized, oppressed, and overworked minions. To a large extent, peasants back then were, indeed, exploited, downtrodden, brutalized, and oppressed. Peasants were placed at the bottom of the social pyramid as a lower caste that had fewer legal rights and protections than the nobles and clergy above them. Moreover, a significant chunk of the fruits of their labor went to support their social betters. A European medieval peasant might have been reduced to the status of an outright serf, bound to the land and unable to leave without the proprietor's permission. A peasant might be required to put more time and effort to tend an aristocrat's fields than his own. However, when it comes to whether peasants were overworked, then, well, as it turns out, not so much. As seen below, modern Americans put in longer hours, with fewer holidays and vacation time, than medieval peasants. On long workdays, we might comfort ourselves with the thought that at least we don't have it as bad as medieval workers. No, sir, at least we are not like old-timey peasants who toiled steadily from dawn to dusk, or medieval artisans who began work at sunup, and kept at it past sunset and well into the night with candlelight. We could console ourselves thus, but we would be wrong. Long hours and the frantic rat race are a feature of the modern era and its innovative linkage of work to a regular schedule and the clock. Before that, people did not work very long hours, life's tempo was slow, and the pace of work was relaxed. Medieval folk were not rich, and they lacked many of the creature comforts we take for granted. However, one thing they had more than we do is free time. For example, an average American in 1987 worked 1949 hours annually. By 2015, that figure had dipped to 1811 hours a year. An improvement, but still nearly 200 hours more than a 13th century adult male English peasant, who worked an average of 1,620 hours annually. A typical medieval workday stretched from dawn to dusk, and the labor could be backbreaking. However, there were many breaks for breakfast, lunch, an afternoon nap, and dinner. There might also be mid-morning and mid-afternoon refreshment breaks. After a harvest, 
peasants might enjoy up to eight weeks off of slack time. And that is without counting all the holidays and religious feast days.